I'm I'm gonna try to keep a cough drop in my mouth during first service. Like about 15 minutes into the teaching, my voice just went, and this is what it sounded like. And probably by the end of the night, I won't have a voice. That's okay though. That's uh, what happens when you talk a lot. But Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy, and we thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for always being so faithful and every and in all things. We ask, Lord, that if it's your will that this spot that's potentially a possibility, if it's your will that it open up, we ask that you would open every door wide open, that you would provide the finances, you provide the paved way, Lord. And if you do this, Lord, would you just be glorified in the most majestic way by us, your people. Either way, we're going to glorify you because you're worthy of it. Oh, Lord, it would be such a blessing. And so if it's your will, we ask that you'd open every door and that you would pave the way and that it would be a blessing. Above all, Lord, we just want to do what you've called us to do. And right now, let's teach your word. As we prepare our hearts for you, Lord, would you move in this place? Would you move in us? Would you stir us up in righteousness, stir us up in love? Would we hear your word? Would we be transformed and changed by your word? Would we be washed by your word, Lord? And would your word continue to do the work in us that you have sent him forth to do? And Lord, would you fill us with your presence fresh right now? Get me out of your way that your will and your way would be done in this evening in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as you guys know, it's been about a week. We have this lady here in New Mexico. She's short and creepy. And she made an ordinance that it's illegal to carry firearms. You know, just saying, but... I'm not pat patting my crotch. <laughs> you know, I'm, pat I'm patting my firearm. <laughs> just for those who, just in case you don't know. <laughs> you know but, but you can't see it because it's you know, tucked. But she made an ordinance and it ended up being illegal. As a matter of fact, I was listening to a lawyer speak. She's made national headlines. She's being talked about by everybody right now. And honestly, I think there is a bit of... There probably is a bit of intelligence behind this move she made. As stupid as it is, everybody's talking. The whole country knows who she is now. You guys know what she wants, what she's wanted this entire time? I mean, something particular. Vice presidency. She tried last year, remember? She wanted to be nominated for Biden, and she got rejected. Well, this type of ordinance is the type of stuff that that group of people is like, ooh, we want her because, and so I think it was a very strategic move. Stupid nonetheless. It was a foolish thing to do. I'm going to call it a foolish oath. I was listening to a lawyer speak, and the lawyer was saying that she is 100% capable of being arrested legally because she has violated constitutional law. Now, the guy said whether or not they arrest her is one thing, but it can be done. She's officially broken constitutional law, and she could be arrested for it. I personally hope they do. But, you know, it probably won't. But the point that I'm making here is she made a foolish oath. And by and far, it's backfired on her. One of the things that I've, I've, I've been humored by to watch is that the left is criticizing her just like the right. I'm watching people that are far left saying she's wrong and then criticizing and lighting a fire. And I'm like, this is your people. <laughs> like, it's bad when your group starts chastising you for what you thought was a heroic movement forward. Well, it turns out it wasn't so heroic. Now, I, I kind of talk about that because today we're going to look at Saul. He's been kind of a meathead since day one, right? He's not been the most prominent man. And God said this would be so. God said the king that you're going to get isn't what you think it's going to be. And Israel's realizing that what they thought they were getting isn't what they got. Today, Saul is going to make several foolish oaths. And one of them is going to result, or should have resulted, in the death of his son. God is going to intervene, or I should say Israel is going to intervene. But he makes foolish oaths. And what we want to learn from today is, let your yeses be yes, let your noes be noes. And be careful with the oaths that you make. If we remember just a little bit about last week, they were preparing to go to war with the Philistines. And remember, Saul is getting anxious because Samuel said he would be here. He said that he would come at the appointed time. It's the appointed time. Samuel, where are you? And so he makes a foolish decision. And he takes the animal and he sacrifices it to Yahweh. And as he's doing so, Samuel walks up. What are you doing, Saul? 
Oh, Samuel, thank God you're here. I saw that you weren't coming in the appointed time. And Samuel stops him and says, what are you doing? Because of what you've done, you've rebelled against Yahweh. The kingdom would have been yours forever. Had you just trusted God and obeyed him, I'm paraphrasing. And essentially he says, because you've done this thing, the kingdom is going to be ripped out of your hands. And it's going to someone better than you, for the Lord is seeking out someone after a man after his own heart. And that's essentially <clears throat> how the text ended yesterday. And it, it really did end in chapter 13, verse 22, saying, you know, as the day of battle was coming, only Jonathan and Saul were found with swords. Remember the rest of Israel, they had hoes and picks and shovels and things of that nature, just farming tools. And they were only able to get them sharpened by the Philistines because the blacksmiths were taken out of the land. And so, you know, if you're going to go to war with the Philistines and you're coming to get your weapon sharpened, are they going to sharpen your weapon to be a weapon? No. They're going to sharpen enough for you to use in a farming status. And so that's where they're at. And that's where we're coming into today's text in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel verse 1. It says, Now the day came that Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come! Let us cross over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. We've already seen a little bit about Jonathan. He's heroic. He's faithful. He's what we would call a man of God. Legitimate. I've said this and I stand on this. Had Saul not been a meathead, I believe Jonathan would have been an impeccable king. I think he would have been incredible. I think he would have done very well. But Jonathan will never get to see the throne because of who his father is. And that should be something that us as fathers really stop and consider. Do you realize <clears throat> that the things that you do today are going to affect your kid's future going forward? I'll give you an example. They say that if a father is absent in the home, the child is, I believe, it's like 60 or 70 times more likely to end up in prison or on drugs. Did you know that? Dad. You know, dads don't seem like that big of a deal. Hear this statistic. If a child lives in a home where the mother, or where no parent serves Jesus, right? None. I believe there's like an 11% chance that that child will come to faith in Christ. If that child lives in a home where mom serves Jesus faithfully, strong Christian woman, there's about a 27% chance that that child will come to faith in Christ. If a child lives in a home where dad serves, mom and dad are both serving Jesus faithfully, I believe it's like 93% chance that that child will grow, in, grow into faith in Christ. Here's a crazier status. If the child is in a home where just the father is faithful, a faithful servant of Christ, that stat doesn't change. It's still about a 93% chance that the child will come to faith in Christ. The power of a father has the power to shape a child's future. Saul's not the best example. And by his actions, his son's future is being shaped. Jonathan, a wonderful man, a man of God, a man who loves the Lord, and a man who recognizes his place. We're going to see later on when God raises up David, and Jonathan's much older than David. When God raises up David, Jonathan's going to come under the submission of David. He's going to come under David's authority. He's going to tell David straight up, I know that God has called you. We know, everybody knows God has called you to be king, and you're going to be king, and my dad's just jealous. And they even make an oath. When that day comes, please don't kill my, me or my kids. Because that would be the typical, that would be typical going forward. That would be the appropriate maneuver because you always want to remove anybody who has what they believe to be a claim to the throne. So if you replace another king, you knock off all their descendants. Otherwise, at some point, the people might rebel or that lineage might rebel and say, that throne was ours and they'll raise up to take it. So you kill them all. And David, out of love, takes in Jonathan's son and basically puts him at his table as his own son in his latter years. But Jonathan, a man of God, says, he says, now that day came, that day of war, that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, come, let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So he, they depart from the group. Now remember, there's only about 600 men last week we saw. Everybody is bouncing from Saul. They, it just... He's not a good leader. He's not a good king. The people are realizing it. They're freaking out. They're taking off. The Philistines have stacked. Remember, it says they gathered like sand on the seashore. And when they left, he was left with about 600 men. Well, Jonathan and grabs his armor bearer and says, let's go. But there's, there's a mission for us. It's called Mission Impossible. And we're going to go do something incredible. Let's go. And he goes. Verse 2 says, Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah 
under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly where this place is, but the fact that this pomegranate tree is identified, the whole point of that is, is it's an identifying mark that the people of the day would have known and understood. Now, I've heard different things of where this place was. And realistically, it's about four miles out. It's about an hour's march. And so I did the calculations. If you walk a normal pace, it's about an hour to walk four miles. And this is roughly where Saul is. They're about four miles out from <clears throat> where the Philistines are. Then the outskirts of Gibeah, and it mentions this pomegranate tree. Again, it was a known tree. The readers of the day would have heard this and understood this and known exactly where it was at. I'm not sure if this tree is still there to this day. It's probably not. But in verse 3, it goes on saying, and Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of Yahweh at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, and the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Now, it gives this interesting little tidbit thrown out here in verse 3. It mentions this little genealogy of priests. It talks about Eli, who had a son named Phinehas, who had a son named Ahitub, he had a brother named Ichabod. You guys remember Ichabod? Remember when Phinehas' wife gives birth? Phineas dies, the brother dies, Eli dies, she kneels over and gives birth and names the baby Ichabod. Why? Because the Philistines take the Ark of God and she says the glory has departed. That's what Ichabod means, the glory has departed. So Ichabod's brother is here, he appears to be the priest at hand, Ahitub, and Ahijah. And now his son, Ahijah, so Ichabod is the uncle of this kid, Ahijah, who's now the priest. He's now the, the guy, he's the player wearing the ephod. And so that little genealogy there gives us somewhat of a time frame. And most, most uh, uh, Bible teachers suggest that it's 50 plus years that have passed since the Philistines had taken that ark. Which makes sense because we now know that Samuel is an old man. We're told that. His years are coming to an end. Lots of time has passed. It's likely that Saul has been king for at least several years at this point. We're not exactly sure because... I really tried up and down to find Saul's lineage and how long he was king, and there is no actual hard concrete data. I tried. I spent probably a little more time than I should have, because at some point you're just wasting time. But I, like, I wanted to find something, and you, you can't really find a whole lot on how long Saul's reign and rule was. Acts gives you a little bit of an interesting notion. He mentions, I think, 42 years, but it appears to be an inaccurate representation, and I'm not going to get into that. But... So we know that a good deal of time has passed. So it gives us a bit of a time frame by mentioning <clears throat> that genealogy. Now these people are all gathered to Saul because that's what you do for war. And they're unaware that Jonathan has gone. In verse 4 it says, Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag <clears throat> on the one side and a sharp crag on the other side. And the name of one was Boses and the name of the other Sineh. The one crag on the north opposite Mikmash and the other south opposite Giba. So essentially, it's these large, sharp hills. And one is named Boaz. says it means shiny. It was a white shine. There was a, a chalk-like material that was on the surface. And it, it, it was bright. It was like, have you ever looked at limestone in the sun? Think of that. It was probably a limestone-like rock. And then on this other one, it was named Sine, which meant thorny. It was these thorny bushes. So you had this really nice contrast of this light, dark taking place. And when the sun would hit it, it probably looked kind of pretty. But there was a pass that went in between that Jonathan takes up to go towards the garrison of the Philistines. And all it's doing here is being descriptive of the topography or the geography of what's taking place. In verse 6 it says, Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Now, we've talked about this in the past. I don't think we have in Samuel yet. But this is just another term for non-Jewish folk, for non-Israeli. So whenever you mention the uncircumcised, it typically in the New Testament is speaking of Greeks. And in the Old Testament, it's speaking of the Philistines, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the, the people that aren't Jewish or Israeli. And so... He says, come, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps Yahweh will work for us, for Yahweh is not restrained to save by many or by few. So Jonathan makes this incredible statement. Mind you, it's him and his armor bearer. He says, let's go, let's invade the camp of the Philistines, the uncircumcised. Let's, let's go. God's so big, he can save by many, he can save by few. He's not restrained by any. 
Now to that I would ask, do you have the faith of Jonathan? I don't always have the faith of Jonathan. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I look at situations and it, to me it's bleak. And I'm like, Lord, can you do it? Is God restrained by many or is God restrained by few by none? God is capable and able in and on all circumstances. In the words of Jesus, with God, all things are possible. How many things? All things. And Jonathan understands that. Jonathan realizes that. So he says, is God restrained by few or by many? Now, I want you to imagine how many people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's like 11, 12 people in here and probably a few people in the back. How smart would somebody be if, if them and a, a young friend of theirs came in and wanted to battle us? Mm. And we got women here too. It'd still be stupid, right? There's no way that that's an, you're outsourced. You're, there's no way you're going to win. We're going to see here in a moment that Jonathan and his little armor bearer took out more than what we, double, almost double what we have in here. And, and we're talking war tactics. We're talking, they didn't come in and fight a bunch of nobodies. I love you guys, but they, they went into war and they battled warriors because God's not restrained by the few or by the many. It's God who gives the deliverance. God is not restrained, period. For me, this is something that I need to hear personally right now because again, I'm looking at what God is, what he may do and in my mind i see all these restraints you know and i'll be honest with you i worry about finances because i do the finances so i see what comes in i see what goes out i see everything and it freaks me out i'm like oh lord what's gonna and i have to remind myself to be like jonathan is god restrained by the few or is god restrained by the many god's not restrained by any nothing is too small for god nothing is too big for god he's god and where he opens doors, they open. And where he shuts doors, they're shut. And as he would say in his own word, doors that he has shut, no man can open. And doors that he has opened, no man can shut. Again, Jonathan is saying similar things, just in different words. God is not restrained. I love verse 7. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself, and here I am with you, according to your desire. I absolutely love that. Essentially, I'm on a quote, Ruth, because he says the same thing. Where you go, I will go. Jonathan, follow your heart's desire. You turn here, I'll turn here. Wherever you go, I'm with you, man. I trust God, and I trust you. I know, I know that God has raised you up. I trust you. I love the heart of this armor bearer. I'll be honest with you. If I was that armor bearer, I'd be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> Dude, what are we doing? Why did we break off from the army? And why are we up here by ourselves? How many Philistines are there? I don't know. It says it was like sand on the seashore. Have you ever seen sand on the seashore? seashore? Is it countable? That's the idea. There's a lot of people. Now, it appears they're broken up into garrisons, as we see here. So it's not like he's going to run into the entire army itself. But the point stands. You're outnumbered. You're outmatched. You're outpowered. He says, I'm with you, man. Do you trust God like Jonathan trusts God? That's the hope. I would add, do you trust your spiritual leadership that God has raised up like his armor bearer did? I talk to you guys about that often. The hardest part about being a pastor is when you're investing in people and they won't hear you. It's the hardest part. There's nothing harder. And if you're a parent, you understand it. It's like being a parent, but with adults. And it's harder, I think, because the adults know better. And there's nothing that stings more when you're trying to show somebody a correct way and then they take the wrong way anyway. Then they come back, you, you try to re-correct them and show them the right way and they just keep going on that wrong path. It's one of the most frustrating things that leadership has to deal with and this was one of the things most people will never see. It, it's, it's mentally draining. Honestly, it's hard not to get hard-hearted sometimes. Because it's like, I've showed you. I've showed and I've showed and I've showed and I've explained. And, and the truth is, when God raises up leadership, trust what God is doing. Now, if they ask you to do something that's anti-God, listen to God. He's the ultimate authority. But realize when God has raised leaders up in your life, they're not there for nothing. They're there. My goal, I've said this over and over, my goal is never to have you do things my way. 
My goal is to truly give you what I believe God is showing me. And sometimes what I give you guys isn't in my best interest. I don't tell you that. You don't know where I'm coming from. I don't need to tell you that. Because my honest desire is God's will for your lives. That really is my desire. It's not my will for your lives because I don't know what God has for you. It's God's will for your life. But this armor bearer recognizes Jonathan's leadership. He recognizes that God is working and moving. And he says, where you go, man, I'll go. Even in the face of impossibility. Verses 8 through 10. Then Jonathan said, behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go to them. But if they say, come to us, then we will go up for Yahweh has given them into our hands. And this shall be a sign to us. So Jonathan has the strategy. And his strategy is this. We're going to reveal ourselves. And if they say stay there, we're going to stay. And and God hasn't given them into our hands. And if they say hey, come to us, we're going to go because God has given them into our hands and we're going to battle. Now, anybody that is half-witted logical, they would look at this and say you do have a death wish. Cuz that doesn't make any sense. But when you're dealing with God, things don't have to make sense. Faith isn't about things that make sense. Faith is about trusting in the Lord. Trusting the things you can't see. And what Jonathan is proposing is illogical, it's improbable, it's impractical, it's, it's, it's borderline foolish. But Jonathan's not trusting his own strategy. He's trusting God. God, I'm asking for a sign here. So he doesn't outright say that to God, but he, I used the word here, how did I say this? Um, he unofficially asks. If God, if they say this, the answer is no. If they say yeah, this, the answer is yes. This will be our sign from God. Either way, Jonathan is putting his reliance on God, not his own ability. And he's going to adhere to the conviction. He's not going to go up bullheaded if they say stay there. He says if they say stay, we're going to back up because it's not from God. If they say come, we're going. And God has given them into our hands. Verse 11 and 12. When both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me. Yahweh has given them into the hands of Israel. What Jonathan is doing here is he's putting wills to his faith. He asked for a sign. Excuse me. God gave a sign and now he's acting on that sign. Have you ever done that where you ask God for a sign and then God gives you the sign and then you have to pray about whether or not the sign was from God? <laughs> right? Right? How many of us have done that? Oh, Lord, give me a sign. And then God shows you, that's not really the sign I want. Lord, is this really from you? I don't think. You ask for a sign. We talked about signs this morning. It's funny. Not Kurt signs, just signs. <laughs> but, you know, here they are. They asked for a sign. God gave the sign. And Jonathan's not questioning the sign. He said, I asked. Here it is. Let's go. I'm in, the, I'm in Jonathan's shoes right now. I've asked God for a sign. I don't know what he's going to do. I'm telling you right now, if God gives me the sign that I asked for, we're going forward. It's not, it's not even a question. I don't know what, how it's going to happen yet, but I've asked God for a sign. I don't even know exactly what the sign is, but I know what the accomplishment will be. And if God opens the door, it's not, it's not even a question. Does it freak me out? Pfft. Oh, my goodness. Dude, I was terrified when we got this place. I was telling Teresa earlier, when we got this place, nobody was even tithing. We came from my house. That was where the Bible study started. And all of a sudden, now we have this rent due every month. And I'm like, I, and I, I don't rarely ever talk about the tithe box. I've been talking about it recently because I got rebuked again for it. So I was like, all right, I've been telling people. So I've been sharing about the agape box. But other than that, like, I've always been under the impression that God's big enough to convict people. I don't have to convict people. So I just let God deal with people. And when we first started, I was like freaking out. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't make a lot of money. I quit my job to be a pastor. You know, 
I make enough money cutting hair on the sides just to pay a couple bills just so I don't feel like an absolute loser, you know, because I have to bring something to the table. And then I spend the majority of my time studying and preparing for three different church services on top of classes, several classes that I teach for the church. And, you know, so I don't spend a lot of time working, making money like I, I used to. I used to make a lot of money and I left the world of money to serve you guys. And all of a sudden I'm here and now this bill's in front of my face. I'm like, I can't pay that. So, Lord, do something. And all of a sudden people just started giving money. And all of a sudden every month the bills got paid. Uh, there's this one time in particular, it was about two months ago, I was genuinely freaking out because the rent was due like in like six days and we were like broke <laughs> and I was like, there was one more service before, before uh, the rent's due and I'm like, Lord, you're going to have to show up because we're going to have to pull money from our savings to pay the rent or something because it's just. I was like just, I was super stressed. I wasn't getting to bed and every morning at like five in the morning, I was getting to bed, right? Sometimes six in the morning. Like it was my, my sleep schedule was so whacked out. It was when I was doing the room, you know, and I was at Home Depot getting some paint and some stuff and I get this call. I'm not going to say the person's name, but the person says, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm good. I'm just at the Home Depot. What's going on? She's like, so I thought I've been tithing at the church, but I haven't. Turns out my tithe, I think, has been going to the old church because I have it set up on PayPal. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, that's okay. And she's like, no, no, I don't want my money going there. I want to come into my church where I'm at now. So I was like, cool. And I was like, well, cool. <laughs> like, you know, I don't, what, what, what would you like me to do? Like, you know, she's like, well, how do I get it set up? I was like, dude, I'm not the person to ask. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I was like, well, I was like, you can see where your money's been going. I was like, somewhere in PayPal, it'll tell you, you know, your pay history so she looks and she's like it turns out my money hasn't been going to the other church I said well cool then she's like right on so she's like can I set it up to there I was like sure so I gave her the link and she set it up and then she sends her tithe and it I mean I started crying because what she gave was enough to pay the rent and the bills that were due for that month and I was like God you know I was at a moment where I was starting to question you and I was like and you just showed me this is your church because that, that next Sunday, like, not a whole lot came in. But we now have the money for the rent, for the gas, and for the electricity. Like, cool. And then we had, like, 200 bucks left over. And I was like, God shows up. It's his church. And so you ask God for the sign. When he gives the sign, walk through the door. They ask God for a sign, impractical sign. I mean, <laughs> come to us. The two of you, come here, little girly boys. We want to show you something. Jonathan says, let's go. That's our cue. When God gives you a sign, do you walk in that sign or no? Verse 12, so the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for Yahweh has given them into the hands of Israel. Who has given them into the hands of Israel? <clears throat> God, Yahweh has given them into the hands of Israel. Verse 13, then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. Was that? Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, put some to death after him. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within a half a furrow in an acre of land. So he comes up, and they knock off 20 men in this plot of acre. Think of like a, a furrow, like maybe the size of this building or two. It was a plot of land where you would till the ground and you would... You would furrow it. You know, there's what's the word I'm looking for here? You would plow it. And it says it was on an acre of land. So I had to know how big of an acre was. And an acre of land is roughly like 205 feet by 205 feet. Maybe even a little less. It's, 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 it's smaller than a football field. Think of it like that. Football field's big, but it's not that big. And so he comes up and in this little plot of an acre, him and his armor bearer fell down 20 men. Think about that. 20 soldiers. That's an incredible feat. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to battle more than one person at a time, but typically the odds aren't stacked for you. They're against you. Unless you're a highly trained fighter, taking five guy, guys on, is it's really hard. Even if you're highly trained, you're, you, you're highly trained. How would you fare against 20 men? Realistically, not well. I mean, you probably get a handful of them knocked out. 
But at some point, there's too many feet, there's too many hands. You only can block and attack so much before you start getting hit. And, you know, it just you're just one person. In this case, there are two people. But even against ten people, that's a lot of people. It could be done. It's just not easy. Doesn't that say Jonathan is a highly skilled and trained warrior? But Jonathan has something special. God. He has the greatest thing that anyone can ask for. He has the living God on his side. Verse 15, it says, And there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked, so there became a great trembling. Now again, this is very poetic. It's not the earth was actually trembling. The point was, the Philistines were shook. Uh oh the Philistines were shook. They were absolutely shook to their core. All of them. From the act of these two men. Now, why do you think they were freaking out so bad? Where did the Jews come out of? Where did these Israelis come out of? What appeared to be the ground, right? We can't see them. These two guys, these guys popped out and knocked off 20 guys. Oh, crap. Remember, the Philistines, they're not on home soil. They're on the Jews, the, Jews, the Israeli soil. And so they're freaking out for what just happened. Did you know God can do that? God can use just you to shake an army. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God. It has to do with Him. And again, where you put your faith and reliance, that's how much strength you have in your corner. And a lot of people, we put our faith in our, in, in our strength, in our abilities. Again, I, I, I talk to a God all the time about this. Like, and I, you'll hear me mention this. Some people will often say, I like your church. What do, how do I correct them? It's not my church. Whose church is it? It's God's church. It's Jesus' church. It's the Lord's church. It's his. It's not mine. It's his church. If it's my church, we have some serious problems ahead. You know? <laughs> I just want you to know, like, if I, am the, if I am the one you guys are truly following, we got problems. And I'm going to let you down. I tell people this constantly. You don't ever put your faith in me. That is the wrong. I am not that source. I do not have the adequate. I, I'm not capable of giving you what you need. I'm not. My job as a pastor is to teach you the Bible. To give you wisdom as God sees fit for your life. That's, that's my job. To love you guys, to tend you, and to feed you. I can't be God for you. As a matter of fact, this has been a, an issue, a current issue in my life is there have been certain people who expect me to be their God and they've gotten so angry they've left the church over it. And I've told them, like, I can't be your God, man. Like, I'm sorry. And if you got to go, then you got to go. But I am not your God. I can't be your God. I'm not adequate. I'm not capable, man. You're asking more of me than I can give. Only the Lord can fill those shoes. I can't. And I tell people this, and this is one of the mistakes that Christians make more than, I watch this happen more than any other mistake, is they put their faith in a pastor, they put their faith in a church, they put their faith in a doctrine, they put their faith in something that they shouldn't be putting their faith into, when it should be in Jesus. That's it. If you follow me, I will lead you straight into a brick wall. I'm just saying, like, yeah, follow me as I follow Christ if you can't follow him yourself. But you can't follow me forever. It's even for my kids. They have to follow the Lord. Jesus' command wasn't follow your pastor. It was follow me, him. And this is where so many of us Christians make that grave mistake is we put our faith in a church, in a building, in an institution, in a pastor. Don't do that. Don't ever make the mistake. Don't ever, don't ever mistake the gift for replacing God. Foolish mistake. The camp trembles. They freak out because Jonathan has God. Verse 16, now Saul's watchman and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude melted away and they went here and there. Saul said to the people who were with him, number now and see who has gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Now, mind you, they're in Geba. They're, they're about four miles out. Now, I don't know if you know this, but you can see four miles out with, with simplicity. You can technically, you can look across the city and you can see the base of the mountain. And if there was a million people there, you would see them because it's visible. It'd look a little off, but you'd be able to tell. For, and that's 13 miles that way, about seven, seven. I know we're seven by 13. I don't know if it's seven that way or 13 that way. Maybe 13 that way. I don't know, to be honest. But that's much further. It's about three or four times the, the span. And... Four miles, I would say, is about from here to 
Hastings. So if we were in a mountainous plateau, oh, Calvary now, yeah, sorry. You know, Calvary West Side or something like that, yeah. That's about four miles, a good four miles. Here to Westgate, it's about four miles. If we were on plateau, you'd be able to see with ease. You'd be able to see movements. It wouldn't be that hard to see. So they're seeing this commotion take place over and the people are freaking out. And they know something's going on. And so Saul, Saul orders a count. Who's not with us? And when they numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Verse 18, then Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God was at that time with the sons of Israel. While Saul talked with the priest, the commotion in the camp of the Philistines continued and increased. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was a very great confusion. So Saul sees this commotion and he calls the priest. And, and the idea here is they're going to inquire of God. And Saul notices the commotion is still happening. So he stops the inquiring and says, let's go to war. Now, um, I don't really know what to make of that, I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't know if he was right in not inquiring of God further or if he was right in just going forward and battling. I, had, I can't ever see why inquiring of God is wrong. I think that would have probably been the wiser move. What's going on, Lord? Should we go with, what is this? Now again, the assumption ended up being good for him because they go and they realize, it turns out that it was a good battle move to go forward because God was already working. He just wasn't aware of it. Verse 20 through 23 says, Again, so Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously, who went up with them all around the camp, even they also turned, um, turned to be with the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, even they also pursued them closely in battle. So Yahweh delivered Israel that day, and the battle spread beyond bet Aven. And so essentially, God puts this muster up in these Israelites and they enter into battle against the Philistines. And they're very outnumbered, mind you. And the Israelites became so mustered, they became so fired up that those who were with the Philistine camp turned against the Philistines and started fighting on behalf of Israel. And they put Israel, uh, they put the Philistines on the run. And I love how verse 23 ends here. It says, so Yahweh delivered Israel that day. That is the most important thing for us to remember in every single victory. It's God who delivers. One of the things that bothers me so much is when we take credit for what God has done. I hate when pastors get credit for what God has done. When worship leaders get credit for what God has done. When anybody touches God's glory, that is one of the most foolish mistakes you will ever make. God will not give his glory to another. He will not share it. It's his it's why I like to ask people well, if they learned anything, if they got anything out of the study. Just because I want to make sure that I know that, you know, I'm where I'm supposed to be. That you know. But sometimes people come up to me like, that was a good teaching. And my response always stays the same. Praise God. God is good. It's all Jesus, bro. Sometimes people, no, but no, but you did a good job. Yeah, praise Jesus. No, no, but you, hey, listen to me. I'm a piece of crap. No, don't say that. No, listen to me. With all sincerity. Apart from the Lord, I am a piece of crap. It's all Jesus. And if you see anything good in me, you're watching God at work. God gives the victory. Because if it was up to me, I would still be getting high hooking up with chicks. I was more concerned with weed than girls. But that's what I would be doing. Making music. Want to be a rap star. <laughs> like That's where I'd be. I'd probably be dead is what I, where I would honestly be. But anything good that you see in me, it's the Lord. And sometimes you see the old me creep through. That's me. That's me. Any garbage you see, that's Walter. The good that you see, that's the Lord at work. But Yahweh delivered. In verse 24, Now the men of Israel were hard-pressed on that day, for Saul had put the people under an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening and and until I have avenged myself of my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Saul makes a foolish proclamation. He puts the people under an oath, under a curse. He says, cursed is the man who eats before I'm avenged. What happens if you're not avenged? You see, the, the foolishness of that oath is dumbfounding. What's Saul's concern here? 
Is it, is it concerned the people? It's his glory. I must be avenged because my pride was touched. And so he puts the people under a curse. The idea probably here is they've done this great victory and we're not finished. You see those Philistines fleeing, we need them. And until I'm avenged, no one eats. Well, how's that going to work for you? Dude, we're hungry. What gives? Like, dude, we just slaughtered what? There's a reason God gives food to people. It gives energy and stability. Now, can you have energy and stability if you're hungry? Yeah, but it starts to waste at your body. It starts to affect the way you maneuver, the way you move, the way you focus. There's a reason why we eat. Actually, some of us are just fat. I'm fat, but you know. But there's a reason why we eat. Starving your soldiers isn't going to accomplish your goal. No. Verse 25, all the people of the land entered the forests, and there was honey on the ground. When the people entered the forest, behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard when his father put the people under oath. Therefore he put the end of his staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. So that's part of the terrain. There are forests in Israel. And they enter into the forest and there's this flow of honey. And the men see it and they want to, it could be dates. It doesn't say, did you say dates? Oh, it could be honeycomb. Okay, then there you go. Well, honey also comes from dates. When you're in Israel, actually, you know, a lot of the honey they sell, they have honey from bees and they have honey from fruits. And date honey is a real honey. It's probably bees. It's in the wild, and it's likely bees. And he, I think it mentions honeycomb. Did I just say honeycomb here? Yep. It's likely bees, because bees make honeycomb. But they see this honey, and can you imagine, dude, you're hungry. There's this river of honey, so to speak, and have you ever been fasting? And then, you know, somebody pulls something delicious out in front of you, and they don't know you're fasting, and it's like, oh, my Lord. You know, like, it's like, you know, you want some? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not that hungry. Lies. You know? This is where they're at. They're hungry. They've been, I don't know if you've ever been in a battle, if you've ever been in a fight. A 10 minute fight is probably like a 40 hour workout equivalent. Like, serious. Like, you know, boxers, you just see them in the ring and they have these two minutes here and 15. Do you know how much endurance that takes? It's not a joke. Like, when you're fighting and you're in an actual battle, the amount of energy you have to secrete is mind-boggling. You have to train for months to be able to endure a 15-round, what is that, about a 30-minute fight? And that's with breaks in between. It's, it's, it's incredible. These guys, are when you're at war, it's not like, hey, pause, 30-second break. No, you're at war. There's not a break. You, you know how heavy swords are? If you were here for the women's ministry... Those are light swords, comparatively speaking. And then you got shields. Then you have armor. Then you have terrain. You have hills and rocks and things in your way. You have the pressure of other men against you. Sometimes you accidentally stick your own guy. Because when you're in this type of guerrilla warfare, whoever's in front of me is getting stabbed. By the time you're done at the end of the day, I mean, it's... I don't even, I mean, I've never had to deal with anything like that. Like, I, I, I've wrestled and I've fought and I've done things. And this is on another level workout. Like, at the end of the day, like, you're tired, you're thirsty, you're hungry. And now the king says we can't even eat. And we walk into the forest and there's a flow of honey. Like, oh. Jonathan didn't hear the oath, so he takes the nerve stick. It says his eyes brightened. Now, this is a real condition. What is a hypoglycemic? I can't remember. There's a word. Is it hypoglycemia? Where, you know, where your low blood sugar is low. Is that what it is, right? And essentially, when you're in that state, if you eat sugar, your eyes literally poof, come to life. And they brighten legitimately. They literally brighten because your lack of blood sugar is suppressing. It's your nutrients are being sucked out from every direction to support your body. And so it says his eyes brightened. 
And he's full of joy. He's like, this is the bomb. What a good way to end the day. God has been for us, and he gives us this honey dope. But Jonathan didn't hear the oath of his father. Verse 28. And then the people said, then one of the people said, your father strictly put the people under oath, saying, cursed be the man who eats food today. And the people were weary. Then Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. See now how my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. He says, my father has brought trouble on the land. The idea is my dad has brought disaster on the land. It's the same word he used for Achan. You guys remember Achan? When the Israelites raid Jericho, remember the walls come down? And God says, touch nothing. Everything here is mine. It's under the ban. I mean, it's, it means it's devoted to destruction. All of it. Okay, Lord. Nothing. Okay? Well, Achan, as they're raiding Jericho, he sees some silver and some stuff. He says, this looks nice, though. He hides it and then destroys everything else. And the next day, the children of Israel go out to battle. And they get the snot knocked out of them. And they come back defeated. Well, we don't understand. God brought us here to die. Like, we just took out this great city. We took out Og and Bashan, the kings of Moab. We did these great defeats, and now God's left us. And so they inquire of God. And basically, God says, somebody took from that which was under the ban. And they do the lot casting, and it ends up at Achan. And they bring Achan forward, and it says, give glory to God. What have you done? He pulls it out. You know, I, I took some of that, that which is under the ban, which is the things devoted to destruction. And then they kill him and his family for that. And then God brings victory to the Israelites again because they touched essentially God's glory. They touched what they not should not have touched. They touched something that was devoted to God. Here, Jonathan uses that same word. You brought trouble to Israel. You brought destruction to Israel. What have you done? He says that because of this, the victory has not been great. Because of Saul's foolish oath, what would have been a great defeat has now become a trouble in the land. It's incredible, right? How a small decision can change the course of a nation. I think of last week, the decision to sacrifice in place of Samuel now removed him and his line from the throne. I love what Ravi Zacharias used to say, a moment of pleasure will destroy, can destroy a lifetime of ministry. You know, you can serve the Lord your entire life faithfully. And at the last moments of your life, if you do something foolish like commit adultery, it'll undo everything you did. All the good that you did in your entire life will be put into question. Do you know that? All it takes is one bad move on your part, one foolish oath to undo a lifetime of good that God has done. And from that moment forward, and they'll go back and re-look everything you've ever done and put it into question. It's crazy. <clears throat> Verse 31, they struck among the Philistines that day from Mikmash to Ahilon, and all the people were very weary. The people rushed greedily upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground and the people ate them with the blood so they go forward and they avenge the king so they struck that day from Mikmash to Ahilan and the people were weary so maybe they didn't it doesn't say whether or not they avenged him I don't know but they're hungry they're, they decide we're gonna eat so they start killing the animals at hand and they start just eating them blood and all just Saul's foolish oath has led the children of Israel to actively disobeying God. Now, is it the law of God that you can't eat until the king is avenged? Is it the law of God that you not eat meat with the blood? That's, that supersedes the law of Moses. It has nothing to even do with the law. That goes back to Genesis 9. The life is in the blood and you shall not eat the blood with the meat for the life is in the blood of the animal. And God says, you don't eat the blood with me. Don't do it. It has nothing to do with the law. It has to do with one of God's personal standards. 
because of the foolish oath of the king here, the people are now actively disobeying God. Now they're sinning against God because of Saul's foolish order. Verse 33, then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against Yahweh by eating with the blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. He's telling the people, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people. Say to them, Each of you bring me his ox or a sheep and slaughter it here and eat it and do not sin against Yahweh by eating with the blood. So all the people that night brought each one his ox with him and he slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to Yahweh. It was the first altar that he built to Yahweh. So now Saul looks on what the people are doing and he's baffled. No, what are you guys doing? This is wrong. Saul, they're acting on this in this order because of your oath. You're starving your men. You know, you can only be starved for so long before you... They've done studies, right? Where they starve somebody of food and then they stick them in a room. And at the beginning of this, they have like porn and they have all kinds of stuff. At first, the guys don't even care. As long as food is around, porn, yeah, they're having blasts, you know, doing their thing, whatever. And after a couple days, they don't, they don't even care about the porn. They don't care about the naked girls. They start to fantasize about food. You can read the studies. You can look them up. And after like a week, they have zero interest. In, they start fantasizing about food. The way they would a sex, the way you'd sexually fantasize in porn, they start fantasizing about food and the delicacies of eating. And you, somebody can only go so long without food before they reach a breaking point. They've obviously reached a breaking point. Now, mind you, when we fast, we don't exert much force or energy, right? These guys are having to be starved while going to war. Again, if you don't understand, I encourage you: don't eat for a week and then run fifty miles. Yeah, try it. I'm serious. I still say 50 miles isn't sufficient for what they're doing, but it'll give you a really good taste. You're not going to last, right? Your body is going to only be able to go so far because your body needs the nutrients and the energy. So these guys are at a breaking point, so much so that they're sinning against God by eating meat with the blood. I mean, so Saul rolls the stone and they slaughter the animals the proper way on the stone, drain the blood, and cook the meat, guys. I'm sorry. Too late. But he does say he built an altar to the Lord. It's the first one that he built. So it seems like Saul is in a place of repentance. But he doesn't actually repent. Some people are sorry for the things they've done, but they never actually repent. And I actually know a lot of people like that. A lot of people are sorry they got caught. But it's one thing to be sorry. It's another thing to be repentant. Verse 36, <clears throat> Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and take spoil among them until morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. So the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Would you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. Saul said, Draw near here all you chiefs of the people and investigate and see how this sin has happened today. For as Yahweh lives, one who delivers Israel, although this is Jonathan, although it is in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die, but none of the people answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You shall be on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said to Yahweh, the God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. Saul said, cast lots between Jonathan, my son, me and Jonathan, my son, and Jonathan was taken. So all, all, all that to say, they want to go and strike the Philistines in the night. And so now he's built an altar of the Lord. He's sorry for his sin. He hasn't repented, but he feels bad. Let's inquire of God. No answer. Now, they used to have a Urim and a Thummim, and there was a way that they would cast lots to inquire of God. And it's likely that every time they did it, the thing came up as either no or no answer or I don't know exactly how it worked but there was a way that indicated that God wasn't answering do it again do it again uh oh alright everybody gather up we're gonna everybody here Jonathan my son even though he's my son if God pulls us we're, we're gonna do this the people escape Saul and Jonathan are left do it again Jonathan is taken Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. 
So Jonathan told him and said, I indeed tasted a little honey with the end of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I must die. I gotta die, dad. Because I didn't hear the stupid oath that you made. Because you spoke out of emotion. Because you were more concerned about your glory and your pride. Here I am, yeah, it's my fault. Because Saul was the king, God is honoring this oath. Hmm. And now because of what Saul has declared, now his son is up for death. Verse 45, 44. Saul said, may God do this to me and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Can you believe that Saul was really willing to put his son to death? I mean, I guess, do you have much of a choice at that point? I'd inquire of God. I'd beg God to figure something out. But the people said to Saul, must Jonathan die who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far be it, as Yahweh lives, not one hair on his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. Then Saul went up for pursuing the Philistines and the Philistines went to their own place the people had enough of this foolish king and they stood up and said no it's not happening today this man here has worked with god today he is not being put to death absolutely not and they get in the way now the question that i ask is was that legitimate should jonathan have died i'm gonna say no and i'm gonna say no for these reasons reasons one the oath was foolish but it was made nonetheless, but it's a foolish oath. Two, this oath was broken in ignorance. Jonathan didn't know what he was doing. He didn't hear the oath. Obviously, the king didn't declare it appropriately so that all men understood and heard. It's like buying cookies, setting them on the counter for people to eat, and then somebody eats one, and then you beat them because they ate your cookies that they didn't know they weren't allowed to eat. How are you going to... <laughs> like it was broken in ignorance. Thirdly, God has already approved of Jonathan. God worked for Jonathan that day, right? Be careful with the oaths that you make. Be careful with the words that come out of your mouth. There is power in the tongue for life and for death. With our tongues we build and with our tongues we destroy. We tear down. Saul made an oath that just about cost him his son. Verse 47 and 48, Now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. And wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. He acted valiantly and defeated the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered him. So Saul, essentially, God used him to fight against the enemies of the land. Verse 49, Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ishvi and Melchishua, and the names of the two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Merab, and the name of the younger, Michal. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimeaz, and the name of the captain of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now the war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any mighty man or any valiant man, he attached him to his staff. To his staff. So, it gives this little briefing of Saul's life. And this is, this is normal for when we're closing out a character in the Bible. Now, next week we're still going to be, be seeing Saul, but what the Bible is doing is it's preparing us to end the focus of Saul, and the focus is going to shortly here be switching to David. It's not going to be chapter 14, but chapter 15, where David officially enters the picture and where he becomes the main subject going forward in the book of Samuel and First and Second Samuel. And so... What, a book or something? Well, <laughs> she's laughing at me, so I'm like, I don't know. But, so, so it's coming to a close with Saul, and so this is common for this to happen, where they essentially outline his life, some of his accomplishments, and give a, a brief genealogy. Now, I want you to note that it mentions two of Saul's daughters, and I believe for the purpose of the one, Michal, not Michael, Michal. <laughs> but it's Michal. And Michal is going to marry David. This is going to be one of his wives. And I believe that's the only reason that the daughters are mentioned. It's probably has to mention the older one and the younger one. And then 
Because at first glance, David gets the opportunity to marry the older one and it falls through. Because David's like, I can't. He's the king. I'm a commoner. Then Saul makes the opportunity to marry Michal, the younger daughter. And he says, I can't. I'm a commoner. Saul is going to give him an, an option. Give me 104 skins of the Philistines and she's yours. Really? So he gives him 200. I wouldn't want to touch no Philistine penis, you know, but so that's what he did, you know. He took, he, he, he did, he got his wife, you know. Hopefully he washed his hands afterwards, you know. But, yeah, but, you know, but, and then it says at the end that Saul continued fighting the Amalekites and the people of the land of the Philistines all his days. And whenever Saul saw a mighty man, he attached him to himself. And that's how most people are, right? You see somebody of prominence, you're on my team. It's just a good move, but, just give that little outline, but that's Ch Samuel 14. Bet you didn't think I was going to finish that. I had my own concerns, but <laughs> Lord, we thank you for being God and for your goodness, for your mercy and grace. I thank you for these beautiful people who love you, Lord, and who want your will for their lives, who desire you, your presence, and your peace. Would you give us your peace, Father, that surpasses all understanding? We do lift up Donna right now and ask that you would give her peace, Lord. You'd give her comfort, that you would protect her, and you'd use her to shine bright in her family in this time of distress. And would it not be a time of distress, but would it be a time of joy knowing that her father is in your presence? We ask, Lord, that you would use this time to draw this family to you. And I pray for these people here this evening that you would bless them going forward, give them a wonderful week ahead of them, and cause your face to shine on them and uphold them with your righteous right hand, Lord. We thank you for loving us and for dying for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.